Chapter 31, The Start of the Search and a New Life Triskelion, Washington, D.C. January 29, 2007, 1230H Local Have you found them? Fury asked while pacing and rubbing his forehead. In front of Fury is Coulson, who is managing a team of techs that should be monitoring how and where Romanoff is. But of course, nothing went to plan, the same with every situation Naruto is involved in. The first incident is how they suddenly disappeared in Clint's homestead. Only Coulson was present at that time. But when Romanoff's emergency band hasn't shown up anywhere in the world, that's when Fury decided to bring in a whole team of techs. Good thing Coulson received a message from Romanoff saying that the band short-circuited during transport. Coulson was able to pinpoint her general location, which is Rome, but anything more exact is impossible. Her phone location shows that it's jumping everywhere in Rome every five seconds with no pattern. Fury would have admired the Naruto's ingenuity and counter-spy techniques, but it's aimed at S.H.I.E.L.D., and it's working. Yes, sir. They are somewhere in Durban, South Africa. Coulson answered. Durban? What the hell are they doing in Durban? Fury asked. His mind is scanning very intelligence reports he read that came from the general direction. A few seconds of furious thinking, he hit upon an idea that is a bit out there, but knowing a bit about Naruto, it is certainly in the realm of possibility. Coulson Search the intelligence reports on Ulysses Cl Ulysses Clow. Coulson nodded and immediately typed in Ulysses Clow. When his profile came up, he projected it towards the big screen. Ulysses Clow. Age 40. Well-connected black market weapons seller. Top 3 on the Interpol list. Mainly operates in a salvage yard near. Durban. Are they going to take him down? Coulson mused. I'm not sure if I should support or not support this. The political blowout if this ever connected with S.H.I.E.L.D. would be such a massive pain in the ass to sort out, but removing a piece of shit from the surface of the earth is such a great payoff. Fury mused to himself, but everyone in the room certainly heard it. Good thing they have enough self-preservation instinct not to call out their boss. Coulson. Send a satellite readjustment and orbit lock request to Satricon. I want eyes on that place as soon as possible. Coulson and his crew immediately blasted the satellite reconnaissance team with Fury's request. They must have been running around with shit in their pants because five minutes later, they have surveillance satellite orbit locked over Durban. Give me eyes, people. Come on. Coulson ordered, making everyone but Coulson move faster. Eyes up. Coulson announced at the same time a live feed from the satellite showed up on the screen. Coulson scanned the area, focusing mainly on each ship. Fury is also observing each ship with his discerning eye until the view panned on top of a boat weirdly covered in splashes of red. Tighten on that ship. Fury ordered. Coulson immediately saw what Fury saw and tightened on top of it. It's basically a massacre, similar to Budapest. A lot of the techs that can't handle the gory image run out of the room, presumably to puke in the bathroom. I guess we found them. Coulson mumbled. The techs returned in waves, looking a whole lot better. They watched the ship with no developments. They were about to throw in the towel since they thought that the group already left until the hull of the vessel suddenly ripped open. There's nothing, nothing there. It looks like it just opened. Can Naruto turn invisible? Coulson observed. No. I think that's a plane with active camouflage, just like the Quinjets. What I wouldn't do to have the god's eyes right now. Fury weighed in. After another few minutes, blue light seemed to pulse from inside the ship. They have no idea what they should expect next, but a spiraling dome of blue energy grinding everything inside it to dust is the last thing they thought they would ever see. After the dome faded, only a large crater was left behind and a whole lot of dust. 
Carlson looked back towards Fury and asked in a joking tone. You still want to bring him in again, boss? After a small chuckle on Fury's disgruntled look, he checked on a hunch of his and looks like he's right. A few seconds the invisible plane appeared or not appeared, Romanoff's phone went entirely offline. Looks like Romanoff got in on the plane and went wherever the hell they're going next. Fury took on one of his serious thinking faces. Carlson recognizes this one as something that appears every time he would make a big decision, just like he saw before with Danvers. Clean everything up, no evidence at what we were doing. No logs, no time in stamps, no emails. If I find out details about this op got out of this room, I'll send every one of you personally to a gulag in Siberia. Got it? Fury threatened everyone with a hard stare down. Everyone nodded frantically, sure that their boss would go through with his threat. Good. Carlson, come with me. He ordered and walked out of the room without missing a beat. Carlson quickly got out of his chair and followed Fury. The pair marched, marched through the Triskelion. Carlson is expecting them to head straight to Fury's office, but when they reached the elevator, Fury pushed the button towards the helipad's way up top. When they reached the helipad, Fury told the standby pilot that Carlson would fly the thing himself. Carlson walked straight to the pilot seat, and Fury sat on the co-pilot seat. Go dark and head to Huntsville, Alabama. We need to pick something up. Fury said in a clipped tone. Carlson didn't even question Fury, and flipped some buttons. After checking everything is okay, he flew the Quinjet towards Alabama. Not like I'm questioning you boss, but what are we going to do in Alabama? Carlson hesitantly asked. I'm going to pick up a file I made in 1995. Fury said. Carlson tried to think back about what happened in 1995, and the only thing that important happened is the Carol Danvers situation. The question is, what file could be so crucial that Fury had to hide it off the shield system? I know what you're thinking, but it's not sensitive. It's just a pet project that we need to start up. Phase 2 would not be enough if we would have to fight someone as powerful as Naruto. He continued. Carlson is, of course, aware about the study of the Tesseract and its future use as a weapon, but what could be more effective than weapons powered by it? It's time to start the Avengers Initiative. Jersey City, New Jersey. January 29, 2007, 1400 H Local. Jonathan Pangborn is living a good life. It has been almost two years since he left Camartage, and he can confidently say that he did well for himself. He runs a booming auto shop, a girlfriend that quickly turned into a fiancé, and finally, he was able to reconnect with his family. But even after all that, there's one thing he never forgot to do, to accomplish the Ancient One's mission personally given to him. To find the Yellow Fox. He, he has always been looking for any news or signs of the fox. Most of the things he found are of inconsequential or hoax, that's why he and his fiancée, Joanna, have not married yet. He told her that the moment he finds the sign of the fox, they would marry, which she accepted readily. It's like she knows that John is still on a mission. The sign is like a self-imposed hurdle for him to accomplish before he lives happily ever after. Joanna only knows his cover story, but he explicitly told her that there is more to everything he told her, and the only time he could share everything is when they are married. They almost broke up when he said that. Currently, he's working on a heavily damaged 1970 Dodge Charger of a cop friend of his from New York. What did you do with this beauty? Jonathan exclaimed while under the hood, checking each small part. Javier Esposito can't help but look ashamed by what he had happened although it been done for the line of duty. You watch the news about the machete killer car chase that went from New York all the way to I-95? Javier asked hesitantly. The guy who managed to nab a Lenko Bearcat. The fuck are you thinking when you took on a glorified tank with a charger? Jonathan couldn't help but shout. 
The absurdness of the situation is just too much for him. Hey. We stopped him. Well, Castle stopped him, but that doesn't matter. We got our guy. Javier weakly defended. How did you find him anyway? I heard he leaves nothing behind for you to get lead on. Jonathan offhandedly asked. Hey. We found a lead, or at least our captain did, indirectly. Javier answered. Why the hell would your captain find some leads? Because the Nine Tails bargained with him. This got the attention of Jonathan. He doesn't know why but something in the back of his mind is screaming at him. He rolled out from under the car and stared at Javier. Who's the Nine Tails? Jonathan asked seriously. Some kind of information broker that only deals with military and law enforcement worldwide. Barter's weird stuff for information. The only catch was that he contacts you by leaving a package. Everybody tried to find him, but he's just too good. In the end, everybody agreed that they'll use the info, but wouldn't let it get out to the general public. So, just don't tell anyone too much. Javier explained in as much detail as he can get away with. Why Nine Tails? I don't know, but Castle said that the Nine Tails could come from Japanese mythology. Some kind of immortal fox demon or something. Javier answered with a shrug. Jonathan quickly stood up and grabbed Javier at his shoulders. With almost a desperate plea, he asked. When did he first show up? Bro. What the hell? Just answer the damn question. All right. The first reported package was received almost two years ago. Now get off me, bro. Javier finally answered and forced his way out of Jonathan's grasp. Jonathan, for his part, is now scanning his mind for everything that he read inside the libraries. One book mentions that the Nine Tails Fox is one of the strongest yukai, or god, but usually only uses their power for mischievousness or pranks. One of their skills are shape-shifting and invisibility. That skill set could explain how it can move around undetected and gather information for selling. If a nine-tail fox demon decided to change the flow of time for its pleasure, that could explain why the Ancient One would see a shift in the future. Javier I need you to get out of here. I'll fix up your car, don't worry. I just need you to go away. Jonathan said forcefully while pushing Javier out of the door. Bro. What the fuck, man? Come on. You're acting weird. Javier shouted. Go, man. I'll call you about the car later. Goodbye. Jonathan said before slamming the door in front of Javier's face. Face. Jonathan could hear him shouting obscenities from the other side, but he has to do something long overdue. Jonathan went ran up the second floor of his garage and went into his office. He closed the blinds and locked the door. When everything is locked tight, he sat down in the middle of the room and meditated. It has been a while, but he was still able to create an astral projection. The projection traveled far until it finally reached its destination. The Ancient One is in the middle of a room meditating when she felt a projection rapidly approaching her. She opened her eyes and saw something that she's waiting for a long time. Master Pangborn Good to see you again. The Ancient One greeted Pangborn, who bowed in respect. I think I found a clue about the fox. Jonathan reported. The Ancient One just gestured him to go on. There seems to be an information broker that is helping the military and law enforcement. No one saw or heard him. He only leaves behind packages with information and a price. Pangborn repeated Javier's explanation. The only thing that identifies it as him is a name he leaves behind, Nine Tails. The Ancient One looks contemplative for a moment, thinking how a nine-tailed fox demon got so strong that even the time stone can't see its past or future. 
It took her a few minutes to think about the implications of a powerful demon loose in the world. Master Pangborn It looks like you have succeeded in your mission. I hope you have a good and enjoyable life. May we see each other again. The Ancient One said with a smile. Thank you for everything, Master. You all are invited to my wedding, whenever and wherever it might be. Jonathan expressed his gratitude with a bow before disappearing. The Ancient One stood up and walked out of the room. She walked towards the training ground. When she reached the viewing platform of the fields, she shouted her order. Master Mordo. Assemble a team. You're going to look for a nine-tailed fox. Mordo, whose mid-step on the air, immediately dropped to the ground. Clint's Homestead, Missouri. January 29, 2007, 1600 H. Local. Where the hell are they? Clint is anxiously waiting at his porch. Thirty minutes ago, he and Laura determined that the baby didn't turn around inside her womb. The baby is breached, causing the labor to be more dangerous for her and the baby. They only noticed it when Laura's contractions continue to strengthen, but the baby can't seem to be pushed out. Running out of time and out of options, he tried to call Natasha. Unlike Clint, who only has basic first aid understanding, Natasha has an extensive repertoire of medical knowledge that can help him, and Naruto's teleportation ability can bring her anywhere instantly. But Natasha's phone was somehow out of range, which is bullshit since it has a global network connection. The reason he was outside right now was because Laura heard what Naruto said to Natasha. The knives are special. Just throw it anywhere, and I'll know when you're in trouble. Clint is still skeptical about it, but with no other choice, he searched for the box of knives Naruto gave Natasha. He ran out of the door and threw it on the ground. That was five minutes ago, and he was slowly losing it. Laura is still upstairs trying hold on for Natasha, but the baby would get out one way or another, with or without complication. Clint was just about to run up the stairs when he heard a particularly agonized cry of Laura, when he suddenly saw Naruto and Natasha appear on top of the knife. He was about to go on a tirade about where the hell ARW they and all that but Natasha cut him off. Before you say anything, we have a lot to do. She said while walking inside followed by Naruto. Clint has enough presence of mind to shut up and follow her lead. Get a got tub of water and lots of towels. After that, go be with Lila. She needs you right now. Naruto and I would handle it. Clint was going to complain about Naruto, but Natasha just cut him off, off again. Just go get the stuff. Clint just nodded and ran off to get what Natasha requested. And you can't go in the room unless I call for you. Natasha shouted as a final order. She looked behind her and saw Naruto staring at her. That was so hot. Naruto involuntarily let out. Natasha would have feel flattered but time is of the essence. Focus, Naruto. Follow me. Laura should be upstairs. Natasha said while running IP the stairs, sure that Naruto was following her. When they got into the room, Natasha went to Laura's side. You're going to be okay. We got you. She said. Hey, N.A.T. What took you so long? Laura said jokingly in a weak voice. Naruto had to pick something up that would help you, but the catch is, you can't see or hear what's happening. Natasha answered seriously. Why? Laura asked in pain because a contraction is hitting her again. Because you can't know what we would use or do. Natasha answered before Clint walks into the room to drop off the items. He walked towards Laura's side and whispered to her ear. Nat would take care of you. I guess Naruto would too. I'll be with Lila. I love you. Stay strong, hun. He then walked out of the room and gave a slightly grateful nod towards Naruto. 
Naruto closed and locked the door when Clint is out of the room. Naruto then retrieved something from his pocket and gave it to Natasha. Natasha looked at it and saw it's a pair of earplugs and a blindfold. We'll take care of you and your baby. Natasha said with a smile before placing the earplugs and the blindfold. Naruto then did a series of hand signs and slammed his hands on the ground. Chains of black writing spread out of the room. Crawling the floor, walls, and ceiling before disappearing. This caused Natasha to stumble backward, shocked by the development. He did another hand sign, which caused his hand to glow white, and he placed it on Laura's abdomen. Press, press the bead with the cross and place it on Laura's chest. It will create a 3D internal scan of her. You could see what's happening inside. The writings make sure that everything in the room is sanitary. I'm going to keep boosting her and the baby's vitality. It would give you another 20 or 30 minutes. Naruto explained, which cleared up a lot of things for Natasha. She's going to file her questions about it for later. Natasha nodded and followed Naruto's instruction when it was all said and done. She finally understood why Naruto was insistent on getting the beads. It is basically the perfect medical device. Clint is in Lila's room, playing with her, trying to get his mind off her wife's pregnancy. It was 30 minutes later when he heard something new. A baby's cry. He was going to run towards the room when he remembered Natasha's order to stay out of the room until called. It was another five minutes before Naruto knocked on the door of Lila's room. When Clint faced him, he also saw Natasha with him. Everything went fine. Laura and the baby are both healthy. Natasha said with a bright smile. Naruto was also beaming behind her. Go on in. We'll play with Lila for a bit. Clint rapidly stood up and hugged Natasha. Thanks, N.A.T. Thank you a lot. He whispered. When he disengaged Natasha, he gave Naruto a pat of gratitude on his shoulder. He ran immediately ran towards the master bedroom and saw one of the most beautiful things he ever saw. Laura was carrying their baby, who's wrapped with towels. Hey, hun. Clint quietly said. He walked over to Laura's side and hugged her. Want to hold him? Laura asked. Clint nodded and carefully took their baby. Hi, Cooper. I'm your dad. I'll make sure you are always safe. He introduced himself. Clint and Laura couldn't help but shed a tear at the moment. Chapter 32 What Happened? By Ninzana, Wakanda. January 29th, 2007, 2200 H Local. Chaka took quite a while to tell the story about his brother, Zuri's role, and the radicalized view his brother took on. By the end of it all, most of the discrepancies that happened in 1992 were answered. Mkathu and Chala are the most affected by the revelations. Mkathu, because he's the current leader of the border tribe, which were the most affected by the incident. The previous elder died during Klaus' distraction. Chala, for his part, was shocked that his father had killed his brother or left a member of the royal family to fend for himself. Baba. Are you saying that there's a prince out there that we know nothing about and didn't bring him home? Chala quietly asked, his rage only being held back by his training. Yes. I entertained the idea of bringing him here, but this is not his home. He has no love for Wakanda, or its people. I cannot say for sure that he would stay the same, but I can't take the chance. Chaka defended himself. Mkatha suddenly stood up and bowed. I would like to retire for the night, your highness. He requested, hoping to get out of the council before he could say something that might jeopardize the border tribe's position. I think it's for the best if we all retire for the night. It has been a trying day for all of us. Sarati suggested. Chaka looked around the room and saw the exhausted expression on everyone. 
Nothing more could be achieved tonight. Yes. You're right, Elder Sarati. Chaka said with a sigh. I at this moment, end this tribal council meeting. He announced. Everyone gave a small bow before leaving quickly. Chaka is sure that by tomorrow night, most of Wakanda would have heard the story. Mkathu alone would surely announce it tonight. The only ones left in the room are Chala, Chaka, Okoye, and the rest of the Dora Milaj. Baba. Let me try to find Njobu's son. Chala requested. No. Accepting a new member of the Golden Tribe right now would jeopardize the stability of Wakanda. Chaka forcefully said. Chala was taken aback by his father's tone. We can't just leave him out there. We are his family. We have an obligation to help him. Chala reasoned. And I am the king. I have an obligation to Wakanda above all. Chaka roared. You would not try to find him. He ordered with a glare. The king stood up and walked out of the door, his Dora Milaj following him. Before he could leave the room altogether, he said, we would speak about this no further. When the door closed, only a seething Chala and a stoic Okoye were left. I might have been ordered not to do anything, but he didn't say someone else couldn't find him. Chala said to no one in particular, but Okoye heard him. You realize that I still serve the king? Okoye deadpanned. Yeah. I know. That's why I'm going to stay put and do nothing. Chala said with a grin. You're going to ask him, aren't you? Okoye asked, already knowing the answer. Of course, Okoye. It's the fastest way to do it. Chala answered with a shrug. The pair started to walk out of the room. What do you think he would ask for this time? Okoye asked, genuinely curious. I don't know. You know him. It's either absurdly cheap or absurdly expensive. He said while closing the meeting room door. Clint's Homestead, Missouri. January 29th. 2007, 1700 H local. Clint left the master bedroom, leaving Laura and Cooper to rest up. Bringing a new life into the world sure must be exhausting. He went towards Lila's room to check on his guests. As Clint was nearing his daughter's room, he heard three voices laughing. It looks like everything's okay at their end. He, he knocked on the door and opened it. What he saw utterly floored him. Natasha, Naruto, and Lila were playing with some kind of robot pony. If he just focuses on that, everything might be okay. But behind him, there's a massive mound of toys and dresses that certainly didn't come from his daughter's cabinet, and he was reasonably sure who's to blame for the mess. The trio didn't stop playing after he went in, so he cleared his throat, trying to get everyone's attention. Lila and Naruto looked at him with an eerily similar expression. This just served to annoy Clint even more. How the hell can a twenty-something man look like his angelic daughter? Natasha, on the other hand, was thoroughly enjoying the play-by-play. -play. She couldn't help herself and placed her face on her palms to stifle her laughter. Hi, Daddy. Look at what Ruto gave me. Lila said with a smile, while showing her father the robot pony. Clint wasn't even sure that kind of toy is commercially available. That's great, honey. Clint forced out with his eyebrow twitching uncontrollably. Would you mind if I borrow Aunt Natasha and Naruto for a moment? Um. There's no need for that chick. I mean, Clint. Naruto said while continuously looking around the room probably trying to find a way out. Clint's eye twitch is now more pronounced. His strained smile just made it more hilarious, although Naruto just ignored him. Naruto faced Lila and hugged her. I have so much fun playing with you. I'll visit you soon. He said with a smile. Naruto then turned towards Natasha, 
and her a quick kiss. I'll pick you up in two days. Just keep a knife on you. He finished his statement with a wink. Sure. Always have it on me. Natasha answered while patting the small, the small of her back. Sorry, we weren't able to do the last part of the date. Are you kidding me? This is way better, although less delicious. Naruto asserted. He saw Natasha's confused expression, so he continued. My plan was for us to go to Japan and eat some ramen. I should have expected that. Natasha said with a smile. Clint was guarding the door while Naruto obviously said his goodbyes, preparing himself to give Naruto a beatdown. Hey, Clint. I gotta bounce. Naruto said with a cheerful smile. You should try and use that bow of yours. You're going to love it. Bye. Naruto announced before suddenly disappearing. Clint just stood there, dumbfounded. He could faintly hear Lila talking about how Naruto is some kind of magician or something, but he's still processing how he could forget that the guy could teleport. Only Natasha's gentle slap to his arm snapped him out of his stupor. You hear that, Clint? Naruto is a magician. Obviously, guarding the door won't work on a magician. Natasha teased. Clint ignored Natasha and took a deep calming breath. Lila. Want to have an early dinner and see how mom's doing later? He said while crouching down to her daughter's eye level. Lila's eyes sparkled and she nodded repeatedly. Can I bring my new toy? Lila asked with those big puppy eyes. Of course, honey. Clint forced out after a pause. You can watch some TV downstairs while your aunt and I prepare dinner. Kids really are full of energy because Lila still has enough energy to run downstairs even though she's been awake for nine hours. Clint and Nat walked out of the room and towards the kitchen. So, Clint drawled out when the pair reached the kitchen. Where'd you guys go? Wow. You lasted until we reached the kitchen. Good for you. Natasha said sarcastically. Clint just tuned out the sarcasm and just waited for her to continue. We had breakfast in Rome. Some friend of his owned a restaurant there. He took you to Rome? Clint asked in disbelief, which Natasha just nodded to. Of course, he took you to Rome. How the hell did he even know someone in Rome? Natasha Natasha started taking out ingredients from the cupboards and fridge while Clint prepares the pots and oven. Natasha had stayed with the Bartons so much that she knows everything in the kitchen. I don't know, but I think he's one of his customers. I thought every one of his customers is military and law enforcement? Apparently not. I met another one of his customers, but I can't talk about it. Why can't you talk about it? Come on. You can tell me anything. Clint. No matter what you say. I can't tell you unless Naruto is nearby to deal with the aftermath. What the hell? Are you strapped to a bomb or something? Clint said in jest, but Natasha's lack of denial caused him to look away from what he's doing. Tell me you're not strapped to a bomb. I'm not wearing a bomb. Natasha answered in a flat tone. Holy shit. You're strapped to a bomb. We need to call Coulson. Clint exclaimed while walking out of the kitchen. Don't Clint. It's fine. As long as I don't let anyone know about stuff, the benefits outweigh the potential danger. The danger drops to zero if Naruto's nearby. Natasha reasoned. What happened on your date that you're 100% sure that he can stop the bomb? Clint questioned after he calmed himself. I'll tell you someday, but I'm more than sure you'll see it. Natasha responded. Clint wanted to push for an answer, but he decided not to push it. So, what can you tell me? Clint bargained. 
I can tell you about the breakfast part, if you're not going to tell anyone on S.H.I.E.L.D. Natasha's answer certainly got Clint's attention, but he needs to know how bad it is before promising anything. From the scale of stealing snacks to hiding a nuke, how bad is it? Knowing a dead hitman is still alive and running a restaurant. Natasha explained. Eh. That's a low one. Clint said after thinking about it for a second. Hit me. Oh, okay. Leon, the professional of New York, is in Rome. Damn. What did you know? The legend's still alive. I know right. Imagine him being your server, and your date is apparently a friend of his. Natasha said while setting up the table. Clint washed his hand and walked out of the room. I'll see what Naruto did to my bow while there's still some light left. It'll only take a minute. Clint informed Natasha. I'll get Lila, and we'll wait for you outside. I want to see what Naruto did to it. Natasha replied. Clint nodded and went up the house and retrieved the still pink bow from the cabinet. He decided that it's best to clean off the pink paint so that it can look more presentable. He entered the bathroom and retrieved the shower head and set the thermostat to high. The moment the hot water hit the paint, it started melting off. When all the paint was off, he noticed the minuscule engraved characters on his bow. It reminded him of the carved characters on the trees in New York. Naruto must have done something to it. Clint walked down the stairs, making sure to retrieve a quiver full of arrows, and walked out of the door. He saw Natasha and Lily sitting down on the porch. What took you so long? Natasha asked. It was still pink, so I washed it. Good thing it immediately came off. Clint answered while retrieving the bow. He showed it to Natasha and asked, You know what these engravings are? All I know is that Naruto uses them to do almost everything. Natasha answered after examining it, but she's almost as clueless as Clint. Clint gave up, for now, figuring out what those signs meant, so he just took an arrow and loaded it onto the bow. That's when he first saw and felt the difference from his old bow. It's more steady and a lot easier to draw the string. Pushing aside the thought for now, and aimed the bow towards a dandelion flower a hundred meters away. He took a deep breath, slowly released it, and fired the arrow. The result was staggering. The arrow flew away in subsonic speeds, and that's with half a draw. When the arrow impacted the ground, it exploded into a cloud of dust. As soon as the the dust settled, everyone saw a small crater with a broken bolt in the center. Holy shit. Clint and Natasha involuntarily let out, which is an entirely normal reaction, but they forgot one small detail that caused them to take on a deer caught in the headlights look. Daddy. What's shit? Lila asked. Chapter 33, Hectic Two Days. Natasha's Safe House, New York. February 1st, 2007, 0300H local. Natasha had a long and tiring two days. After testing Clint's bow, a still exhausted Laura rushed down the stairs carrying a crying Cooper. The explosion was apparently loud enough to wake up Laura and the baby. Add to the fact that Lila was continuously asking what's shit, and you got the recipe for an angry mother. Fearing for her safety, Natasha took a page from Naruto's playbook and made a hasty retreat. She quickly packed her bags and said goodbye. While boarding the Quinjet, she can see the pleading look on Clint's face for her to stay behind, but her instincts are telling her to go, and that never steered her wrong yet. If that's bad, the next one's worse. Natasha foolishly decided to go to work the next day. She went straight to her office to get some peace, but the universe must have decided to pile it all on her that day. Flashback start. Come in. Natasha shouted after she heard a knock on the door. The door opened slightly and Coulson peeks through the gap. Fury wants a report. Coulson announced. 
All right. Natasha replied with a sigh. She stood up and walked out of the room, making sure she locked it behind her. Her. Coulson started walking towards Fury's office, while Natasha walked beside him. Anything interesting happened when I'm out? She inquired. Not really. Just some agent who decided to take out an arms dealer without orders. Coulson responded with a shrug. Damn. Saw that, didn't you? Coulson just gave her a blank stare. Of course you saw that. I'm just going to report with you there, so I don't have to repeat everything. Coulson went straight inside Fury's office after doing a biometric scan. Natasha followed behind him, and she saw Fury reading and leaving notes in a folder while sitting on his desk. When she and Coulson sat down on the guest chairs, Fury laid down the reports and closed the folder. That's when she saw the title of the report, although it didn't clue her in on anything. The title on the folder, Avengers Initiative. Nice to see you, Romanoff. How was your date? Fury asked in a friendly tone, which just made Natasha all the more nervous. Nothing out of the ordinary boss. Natasha answered in a straightforward tone. Oh, so taking out Clow is a normal thing? Fury retorted with a raised eyebrow. Let me correct myself, nothing out of the ordinary for Naruto. She answered back. Enlighten me by answering some of my questions. What happened to the emergency band? The thing short-circuited after the jump, but I think Naruto knew about it, because he's the one who told me to contact you. I guess he's also the one who caused your phone signal to jump all over Rome? My signal's jumping? Natasha asked, genuinely confused. Well, that answers that. Fury blurted out. So, where did you go? Natasha internally panicked. She can't really say where they went since it might expose Leon to S.H.I.E.L.D. I don't know. Naruto teleported us in an alleyway behind the restaurant. All I know is that it's a kind of family restaurant with private booths, and it's far away from the center since it's quiet. She lied through her teeth. Fury studied her for a moment. Trying to find any indication of her lying, but gave up quickly since she's one of the best liars there are. What happened after? Fury proceeded. We exited outback the Naruto teleported us again to some tree lean. I only knew where we were in Durban because I squeezed out of Naruto. Natasha reported. I can't say anything else, boss. She weakly added. We are the only ones here, and the room is in a communication blackout mode. You can say anything here, and it won't come out. Fury claimed. I can't say, boss. Natasha pushed back. I order you to report the events in Durban. Fury said with authority. I'm invoking Article 8, Subsection 14 of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agent Handbook. Natasha's retort took Fury and Coulson back. Article 8 talks about circumstances where an agent can disobey a direct order. Subsection 14 is about when an order would cause certain, immediate death to the agent. What can you tell me that happened after you arrived in Durban? Fury tried to find a workaround. Naruto doesn't only deal with military and law enforcement. He also has some private customers. Like P.I. jobs, I guess. Natasha helpfully added. She needs to give them something to get them off her back even a little bit. Oh, and if you haven't heard it yet. Laura just gave birth. Naruto and I help her. She added. Damn. Mosel tove to him. I'll add a three-month undercover mission on his file. Fury mused. Clint is one of his best agents, and giving him some concessions would go a long way. I expect you to provide me with an unofficial written report of, of what you can say. He ordered, thinking about how a written report might reveal something new. 
Fury took a piece of paper from inside the folder and handed it over to her. Moving on. I want you to read this for me. Natasha scanned the paper. As she read through the paper, she realized what Fury wanted to do, and she doesn't know how to feel about it. You want to assemble a team of enhanced that can fight against Naruto? Natasha asked weakly. Not him, someone like him. Someone not on our side. Fury answered. We don't know who or what else is out there. Naruto may not only be the only one out there with his power level. Hell, chances are, there's someone stronger than that guy. I want to be prepared for any eventuality. I want to have a symbol that humanity can really behind when dark times are upon us. He finished, but everyone heard the underlying message. If Naruto turns, they'll take him down. This is not a long list, boss and let's be honest, Barton and I are barely enhanced, and the other guy is a loose cannon. Natasha reasoned. I know. That's why I want to know if Naruto is a viable option on this team. Power-wise, more than qualified. But on the personality side, there's a problem. Naruto might look like he loves the spotlight, but he thrives in the dark. The same problem with Barton and me. You won't get your symbol with us. The side Naruto is even more predictable than the big guy. Do you have any idea how to make him join the Avengers initiative? You need to make him want to join. Any other option would either reject the offer or make him an enemy, and we both know the last one is the worst outcome. Fury thought hard about Natasha's statement. Everything Romanoff said was true, but with Naruto's appearance, it opens a whole new ballpark of things S.H.I.E.L.D. needs to deal with. That's all, Romanoff. I'll be expecting your written report by the end of the day. Fury said, dismissing her. Flashback end. The following day isn't much better. She was in her office again when Naruto decided to do a surprise visit before going to Wakanda. Wakanda. It would have been a cute thing to do with other girls, but Natasha is a world-class spy. As soon as Naruto played Guess Who, she drew her gun and shot Naruto multiple times in the gut. The sound must have resonated outside since the alarms for an attack started blaring. Good thing Naruto is immortal and can take multiple hits from a 9mm, or she would have been cleaning buckets of blood from her office. Naruto gave her a quick kiss before he started writing something down on a piece of paper and left it on the table. He then grabbed her hand, and the next thing she knew, she was in Wakanda again. Everything went a little bit more subdued than the first visit. She can feel the underlying tension in the air, especially from the border tribe members. As expected, she and Naruto were interviewed while sitting on the lie detector chairs. Nothing new came except she now knew that Naruto kept leaving packages for the king just to mess with him. She could see King Chaka between pissed and entertained. The underlying tension in the room only lifted after Naruto gave everyone a taste of his cooking, even her, and she has to admit it's the best thing she ever tasted. When Naruto revealed the name of his restaurant, that's when she realized that the hottest new fast food, Shikugakure, is owned by Naruto. As expected, the tribal council quickly approved the opening of the restaurant, checking one of Naruto's request. The royal family would even help in its construction. The next request was also approved. Apparently, everyone wanted to see if Naruto can damage or destroy a piece of pure vibranium. Flashback start. The tribal council, royal family, Dora Milaj, guards, Wakandan scientists, and Natasha are on a troop transport 10M of the ground. 50 meters in front of them is Naruto, without his Kamoyo bead beads, playing around with a ball of pure vibranium with a diameter of a foot. They can clearly see him through a holographic projection screen attached to the transport. Your Majesty, with all due respect, no one can destroy pure vibranium. It can only be changed from one form to another. It's the perfect representation of the law of conservation of mass. A scientist told King Chaka. 
You know that, I know that, we all know that. But there's nothing lost in this experiment. Either he destroys the ball, and we learn something new, or he doesn't, and we just took a pleasant stroll outside the city. The king answered. Naruto kept tossing the ball around until he placed it on the ground. He removed his jacket and shirt and put it somewhere behind him, which then disappeared, leaving him in his black slacks and boots. I still can't figure out how he does that. The largest thing I saw him do that was his motorcycle. Chala said a little loudly, probably to answer everyone's question. He's the one holding on to Naruto's kamoyo beads. Natasha studied Naruto's body. She saw black marks running everywhere on his abdomen and forearms. The characters are similar to the ones visible on the knife, so the tattoo might not just be decorative. Naruto picked the ball again held it close to his chest. With his free hand, he did a single hand sign and said something. Black flames erupted around his body, covering everything. The fire was so hot that they could feel it burning their skin even from 50 m away. They were forced to move back to the troop carrier until they were half a kilometer away. From that distance, they can see the grasses turning into ash, the rocks and soil melting, and the air forming small flashes of lightning probably due to the formation of plasma by the superheated air. The only one they can see not affected by it was Naruto. Precisely 20 seconds after the flames appeared, it died down. They can finally see the aftermath of what happened. Naruto was standing on top of a lake of lava 20 m wide, in his right right hand was a pile of dust. He did another hand sign with his free hand and this time, cold air blasted everywhere. The lava he was standing on immediately solidified. The wildfire he started also died down. Great, Bast. How can anyone survive that? Chaka exclaimed in awe. What did he say before the fire erupted? Chala asked. I think he said Amaterasu. Amaterasu. Okoye answered. The Japanese goddess of the sun. Natasha added weakly. A fitting name. Chaka replied. Your Highness, the fire burned as hot as the surface of the sun. A Wakandan scientist voiced out. And it doesn't appear to be its hottest, since the temperature keeps on climbing. As the scientist was speaking, Naruto, now wearing a shirt, was jogging over to the transport. He leaped onto the carrier when he was a few meters out. He walked over to stunned scientists, grabbed his hand and opened his palm. Look into this for me, will you? Naruto said while dumping a handful of black dust to the man's hand. He walked over to her side and finally noticed all the stares on him. Bast. How can anyone survive that? Chaka exclaimed in awe. What did he say before the fire erupted? Chala asked. I think he said Amaterasu. Okoye answered. The Japanese goddess of the sun. Natasha added weakly. A fitting name. Chaka replied. Your Highness, the fire burned as hot as the surface of the sun. A Wakandan scientist voiced out. And it doesn't appear to be its hottest, since the temperature keeps on climbing. As the scientist was speaking, Naruto, now wearing a shirt, was jogging over to the transport. He leaped onto the carrier when he was a few meters out. He walked over to stunned scientists, grabbed his hand and opened his palm. Look into this for me, will you? Naruto said while dumping a handful of black dust to the man's hand. He walked over to her side and finally noticed all the stares on him. What? Is there any dirt on my face? Flashback end. Natasha could have punched him silly right there and then, but his obliviousness just makes him all the more endearing. She hates that she started to fall quickly, but there's nothing she could do against it. Naruto's experiment spurred the Wakandans into a fervor. They consider vibranium as a sacred metal, 
and with good reason. It's used in almost every part of their lifestyle, and the reason why they have advanced so much. The royal family held a small gathering as a celebration for the new friends of Wakanda. Well, it's more like they're trying to bribe Naruto to do more tests and jobs for them. She just happens to be with him. Naruto went batshit crazy during the party. He managed to outdrink in the party, even Chala, who she now knows has a more similar skill set to Captain America. They decided to leave when the party was dying down. But before they could go, Chala pulled them aside. Flashback start. I have a, I have a job for you. Chala said to them when they were sufficiently out of the way. Let me hear the details first before I give my price. Naruto replied. I want you to find my uncle Njobu's son. Naruto thought about it for a second and pulled out a folder from behind him. Are you going to contact him? Naruto asked seriously while lifting the folder. Yes. I intend to bring him home. Chala asserted. Damn. I can't give this to you in good conscience. Why? Chala asked with a slight snarl. How can I put this lightly? Hmm. Naruto mused. Oh, I know. He'll destroy Wakanda. What? His whole life, he prepared for one single purpose. Be the king of Wakanda and basically take over the world. Of course, it's for fighting racism against dark-skinned races, but Wakanda would inevitably fall if he becomes king. So, what do you want me to do? Just forget about him? Nah. I'll make contact with him. We just need to keep anything Wakandan as far away from him as possible until we change his worldview. Chala thought about it, and Naruto's plan made the most sense. It would eventually bring back a member of the royal family while keeping Wakanda safe. All right. Thank you. Chala said with a bow. Hold up. I haven't said my price yet. Naruto interjected. Right. Forgot about that. So what's the price? Chal sheepishly replied. A copy of how a vibranium suit could be made. You want to know how to make a suit? Not a suit itself? I was going to ask you to make Natasha a suit, but I have another material in mind. I just want to know how you make one, so I have an idea. Naruto explained. Natasha, who was listening in on the conversation, perked up. Having a suit made of vibranium would be awesome, but the mystery material Naruto said indeed piqued her curiosity. I can do that, but I want monthly updates about it. I'll call you over the Kamoyo beads in a month so you could pick it up. Chala replied after a moment of thinking. Flashback end. Natasha can't believe what happened in the past two days, but the most shocking thing that happened was after Natasha brought him to her safe house. One thing led to another, and now she's lying on the bed with Naruto beside her. Both of them naked. What are you thinking? She heard Naruto asked. Just how crazy everything the last two days have been. She responded. Naruto gave out a small chuckle. So, what happened to the second and third date? Naruto continued. I thought this was the second date? She replied. Naruto pulled her closer to him and hugged her. This is not the second date. This is more like a business trip or something. You still have to plan for a second date. Naruto answered while kissing the top of her head. Yeah. You're still going to teach me how to build a bike. She said while looking straight to his eyes. She then turned around and mounted him. But, in the meantime, I have more enjoyable activity in mind. She finished before kissing him deeply. Chapter 34, I Might Be Human Natasha's Safe House, New York February 1st, 2007, 1400 H Local 
Natasha woke up to a discomfort she never experienced before, never thinking that someone could do something like that for quite a long time. The assassin twisted and stretched her body to relieve some of the soreness. That's when she noticed the heavenly smell of eggs and bacon. This would have normally caused her to feel elated, but now it caused her to panic. She reached for her phone on the bedside table and looked at the time. Fuck. I guess I'm on an unexpected mission then. She said to herself. Natasha got out of the bed, jogged to the bathroom, and did her daily ri rituals. She got out of the washroom in her black bathrobe. When she got out of the bedroom, she saw Naruto plating the freshly toasted bread. Good morning Nat, or should I say good afternoon? I made breakfast, so I guess it's morning. Naruto greeted her with a bright smile. Natasha sauntered over towards Naruto and gave him a deep kiss. This looks wonderful. Probably taste wonderful too. You could probably take over the world with your cooking. Natasha complimented with sincerity. Contrary to possible stereotype, he doesn't only know how to cook god tier ramen. His range of cooking goes far and deep as supported by the cuisines he cooked up in Wakanda. Come on. I want to taste your food again. Don't exaggerate. You just tasted my food yesterday. Naruto retorted with a blush. Sometimes, his insecurity peeks through his confident exterior, and Natasha could see something deeper behind those eyes. A sadder and darker history. Come on. I want to get some calories in my body after last night. Natasha teased before pulling Naruto and sitting down in front of the table. Naruto sat down in front of her. Ididakamasu. Naruto quietly said. Natasha, for her part, waited for Naruto to finish giving his thanks. Naruto and Natasha ate in companionable silence, enjoying their meal, until Naruto noticed Natasha continuously glancing at him. N.A.T. You're a world-class assassin. Just ask the question. Naruto told Nat. Natasha choked a little when he had Naruto since she thought she's subtle. She drank a glass of water to wash down the food. All right. Natasha said before dropping the food on her plate so she could focus on the talk. There are some things I want to know about you before any of this. She pointed Naruto and herself. Continues. Call me old-fashioned, but I want to know more about the person I'm going to have a relationship with. She finished. You want to be with me? Naruto hesitantly asks. Naruto. I strapped a bomb on my wrists because you said it's all right. All right. I think we're past the new dating stage. Natasha deadpanned. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Naruto sheepishly said with a scratch with the back of his head. I have one question that I need a real answer to because it could explain everything. Natasha stared deep into his blue eyes. Are you human? Naruto sighed, already expecting the question. Normal humans don't do the stuff he can, and everything he did in front of Natasha was more than enough to clue her in. Naruto sat straight and said, Before I answer that, I want to know what you think I am. Two ideas are running through my head. Natasha responded while lifting two of her fingers. One. You're an enhanced. This could explain most of the things you could do, but there's one problem with that. What is it? Naruto asked. Enhanced humans only have one ability. That's because whether we like it or not, the human body is weak. It can only handle one enhancement. It might be as straightforward as having super strength, or as complicated as being able to control plants. Of course, each skill has a certain level of versatility that can make abilities look like two different things. An example would be the ability to fly, super strength, and telekinesis, but all of this could be explained by having the ability to control gravity. Natasha explained. 
But in your case, there isn't a single thing that unifies everything that you could do. I thought you have the ability to control space because of your teleportation. It could also explain your speed, strength, invulnerability, and your ability to take out and hide items from behind your back. Maybe even your cloning if you push it, but there's one thing it can't explain. That fucking satellite really screwed me over, huh? I thought I'm sneaky enough in the beginning. Naruto said to himself. That statement of his confirmed to Natasha that he's already aware that the US government has a video of his abilities. What's the thing it can't explain? He finally asked Natasha. The fire you created yesterday, as well as the instant cooling. Natasha answered. I tried to think about how you did it. I first thought about the spiraling dome that destroyed the ship. The dome could also be explained by space manipulation, but the fire was just too different from it. You might achieve the heat by colliding space together and performing controlled nuclear fusion, but the problem now was that the scientists detected no radiation. In conclusion, I don't think you're an enhanced. Naruto stood up and clasped Natasha's hand. He gently pulled her towards the couch. They sat there side by side but facing each other. What your other idea? He asked when they were finally settled in on the couch. You're an alien. Natasha answered straightforwardly. She can see Naruto thinking hard about what he should say next. They were sitting there for a few minutes when Naruto stood up, did some hand signs, and slammed his hand on the ground. The same as the last time, writing spread out across the room before disappearing. She assumed that it was some kind of anti-surveillance measure, since the sound of traffic outside suddenly stopped. I'm not exactly sure what I am. He said in a quiet voice. But I know, at the very least, I was born human. Natasha hid her surprise. Even though she expected some form of confirmation to her question, hearing it was still a shock. What happened? She asked, drawing from her skills and experience, trying to make it easier for him. There's a few basic knowledge that you need to understand first. He said. I'm not from this world. Hell, I'm not from this universe. Universe. Natasha finally connected a lot of details. The light, his initial lack of identification and background, and some gaps in basic knowledge. The world I came from is called the Elemental Nations, named after the five largest countries, fire, wind, lightning, earth, and water. Think of it as feudal Japan, except for one major change. We can use chakra. Chakra? Like spiritual energy? Natasha couldn't help but asks. It's more like the combination of environmental physical and spiritual mental energies, but it's almost the same. Naruto answered. There are three specialized units the daimyo can call. The monk, the samurai, and the shinobi ranked in strength. He created a single hand sign, and a stereotypical monk with a staff appeared. The monk, as the name suggests, is a religious man who had forsaken all worldly possessions. They are trained in temples to pray and to fight. Skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat and the staff, a single monk can decimate a group of bandits with well-placed hits. They can also use chakra to reinforce their bodies and expertly control a single element. The reason monks are rarely called upon by the daimyo is that they would instead make peace than war. Natasha can't take her eyes off Naruto's representation of the monk since, as he was explaining, the monk would move to show its skills. The monk then turned into a samurai-themed metal-armored man. The samurai. The right-hand man of the daimyo. They help him with all the bureaucracy and administration. But don't be fooled by their day-to-day -day job, when it comes to war, they are efficient and deadly. Trained in the art of kenjutsu and chakra enhancement since birth, they can cut down battalions of men. Their chakra swords and armor makes them almost invulnerable in the battlefield. They follow a strict code, code of honor that makes them fight everyone face on. Any violations of the code would immediately label them as ronin. 
Their only downside aside from their code of honor is that the daimyo needs them to run the government efficiently, that's why they are rarely called onto the battle. I'm guessing you fall onto the shinobi category? Natasha asked. That's right. The samurai then turned into a younger Naruto, maybe around 12 or 13 years old, wearing a god-awful bright orange worker suit. The shinobi is the most potent and versatile warrior. They are like a combination of monk and samurai, but without all the constraints. We have no code of honor, only laws of war. We would stab you behind the back if it made the job easier. The shinobis are mercenaries. They would do almost any job for money, as long as it doesn't have a negligible negative impact on them. Trained as young as six, in hidden villages, most of us would graduate at twelve, or thirteen, and having our first kill not long after. Natasha couldn't help but draw parallels between the shinobis and her. That's when something struck Natasha. Naruto was a shinobi, making them more alike than she could imagine. There are three primary skills shinobi can learn, Jinjutsu, Taijutsu, and Ninjutsu. Jinjutsu is the ability to create illusions with your chakra, just like what I'm doing now. He said, pointing to the image of his younger self. Taijutsu is the ability to strengthen one's body and fighting styles. You can also throw in weapon fighting skills in there. Ninjutsu, on the other hand, is anything not in the first two categories. He showed a blue spiraling sphere in his hand to demonstrate ninjutsu. Of course, there are other categories like kekai genkai, or simply any specialized skill that can be inherited, and fuinjutsu, which are sealing techniques using characters that can give in instructions to chakra and perform a function. Almost everyone can use chakra in your world, right? Natasha asked, still trying to comprehend everything he said. Yes. Then why do you say you're not sure if you're human? Let's go back a bit. Naruto said. In a world full of chakra, some things are bound to be different too, right? Natasha nodded. Behind him, nine monstrous beings are formed. In the elemental nations, there are nine immortal beasts made of near limitless chakra. Each of them can theoretically wipe out all life on the planet. They are walking calamities that have individual types of abilities. Now, what do you think the hidden villages would do with these powerful beings? Natasha thought hard, but she doesn't like where her thought is continuously going even after thinking about the positive side of humanity. Even now, they're trying to do the same with the Tesseract. They would capture them and harness their power. Natasha quietly answered. Naruto chuckled darkly before continuing. Got it in one. Naruto mumbled. The hidden villages fought over the tailed beast or bijou, but no one can continuously and safely control a force of nature. That's why they did the next best thing. They would place a bijou in a newly born baby to make it have the chakra reserves of the beast. Jinchuriki. The power of human sacrifice. Natasha weakly whispered, remembering about his titles in Wakanda. She looked upon an image of a nine-tailed fox, and that's when she connected the dots. You have a nine-tailed fox in you. The QB was released from its previous vessel on the day of my birth, birth, wreaking havoc to my hometown, killing thousands. With no other viable candidates, he was sealed in me. Naruto said while lifting his shirt and pointing at the spiral around his navel. I left the elemental nations after the fourth shinobi war, because I just had enough of all the death and war. I guess I just can't get out of that kind of lifestyle since I'm still doing this now. He finished with a chuckle. Natasha digested everything he said. Categorizing and tagging everything he said. As she was running through the stuff, she noticed something. The only thing personal about him that he added is that he's the vessel of an immortal beast and an orphan, which is still pretty big but pretty lacking. She knows he's not saying something, but maybe they're more alike than she likes. They both play things pretty close to the chest. I guess we should continue with our meal, huh? Natasha suggested. Yeah. 
Go on. I just need to use the bathroom. Naruto replied before standing up and walking to the restroom. When he got inside, he locked the door and turned on the faucet. Kit. Why didn't you tell her about the nine of us, and you basically being a god? Karama asked. I like her, Karama. I don't want to scare her away. I think saying that much normally would of her running towards the hills. I think three years of mourning is more than enough. Gyuki said. Hinata would have kicked your ass if she found out you mourned for her for that long. Chomei added. Naruto couldn't help but chuckle. Hinata would certainly kick his ass. He glanced at the mirror and saw a tear rolling down his eyes. He washed his face and dried it off before walking out of the bathroom and headed straight towards the table. I just realized something yesterday. Natasha said when Naruto sat, sat back down. You destroyed $50 million worth of vibranium just like that. The same thing Captain's indestructible shield is made out of. That stuff's worth 50 mil. How rich are those guys they just let me do anything with that? Naruto exclaimed. Natasha can't help but laugh at Naruto's reaction. How did you create that black fire yesterday? Natasha asked. Naruto didn't answer immediately, but stared into her eyes. She was surprised when it suddenly spun and changed into something entirely different. His scara turned black. Iris turned blood red, and the pupil turned blue. A silvery-white floral eight-petaled pattern formed around his pupil, with each petal tip having a golden comma. It has an eerily white glow that seems to be coming from the inside. What's that? Natasha asked with a small quiver in his voice. This is what I call a shinigan, or the death god's eye. It's a combination mutation of three different eyes. Naruto explained. One of its abilities is to call the fires from hell. It's the hottest fire that can be produced. One of its abilities? Yeah. It has a shit ton of it. Too much to get into right now. Natasha understood Naruto's message that he doesn't want to talk about it right now. They finished eating and cleaned up the table. When they were done, they walked back and sat down onto the couch. Fury would skin me alive. He would want to know about what happened in my office and what the hell I've been doing since you decided to kidnap me. Natasha said with a groan. Don't worry about it. Just tell him you took a piece of vibranium from a Russian oligarch. Naruto answered with a shrug. Come on. This is Fury. He would investigate what I report. Just give him this. He said while handing over a piece of rock. Rock. Is this a vibranium, or? Yep. Took down a Russian oligarch this morning. He's funding some terrorist groups in Afghanistan. One of his hobbies is collecting meteorites or anything that came from space. Naruto explained. This rock, on the other hand, came from Wakanda. Just put two and two together. Et voila. You know what? I'm not going to question it and say thanks. Natasha replied, a little exasperated before taking the rock. Her phone suddenly ringed. She picked it up from the table and checked the number. Speaking of the devil. She said to Naruto before answering the phone. Hey, boss. I was just about to call you. Chapter 35, Chance for a New Life RAF Base Hospital, Alconbury, UK April 9, 2007, 1350 H Local Naruto is walking down the hallway with a hop in his step. He could confidently say that he's currently living a happy life and at the forefront of all that is Natasha. The Black Widow herself the good thing about having an immortal beast made of chakra is that he can make sure that her feelings are at least real without doing anything drastic. Although Karama is all for having Natasha as a mate 
he still monitored her emotions on Gyuki, Chomei, and Matatabi's urging. He completely understands their motivation, since it's Natasha's job to make others fall for her, and making them do her bidding. Their second date was awesome. It took them a while to find an available date since Fury gave Nat a surveillance job, but when she finally finished it, they were able to tinker with her bike collection. He hasn't introduced her to chakra metal yet, so he wasn't able to make her bike monsters, but with his knowledge, they were able to make it significantly more powerful. Speaking of knowledge, he was finally able to learn some things from Tony. He's an unorthodox teacher that gets distracted a lot and focused mostly on a hands-on approach. He was even able to help Tony with the problem of his flashback start. Maybe I should just do the railgun project. That would be a whole lot easier. Naruto heard Tony say while they are both working on some projects on the computer. Naruto is currently trying to figure out how to integrate a jet engine on his bike. What are you working on anyway? You've been mulling over it for almost a month now. Naruto asked before walking over towards Tony's station. Rodi brought over a problem for me. Tony answered while rubbing his forehead. Some general decided that he wants a horizontal explosion missile. What the hell is that? Naruto asked, seriously confused. Well the guy doesn't want a circular explosion. He wants a missile that can wipe out guerrilla troops across a whole mountain range. You know, like the mountain ranges in Afghanistan. Tony explained. What's the problem you're running into? I can't just make a missile that can bomb the whole mountain range. It would cost a lot just for the explosive alone, don't even get me started on the delivery device. Then why don't he just fire multiple rockets? Because it would cost too much. Tony answered with a groan. How about smaller missiles, or a mobile battery? The range isn't enough. I want a full-size missile that can act as a mobile battery. Hmm. Why don't just stuff a bunch of smaller missiles inside a larger rocket? Kind of like a cluster bomb with individual rockets. You can launch the large one carrying the smaller missile, and when it's in range, they just launch. That way you can make any shape of explosion you want. Naruto suggested with a shrug. His suggestion came from his vast experience of using shadow clone explosion technique. Tony sat, sat there on his desk, thinking about Naruto said. He's running the numbers, blast radius, production cost, and travel radius. Each missile would be 10% cheaper than other weapon systems with comparable damage output while possibly extending the range. Motherfucker. Tony whispered to himself. He's has been trying not to use curse words since Morgan was born, but he just seems to be an appropriate time to use one. I could just kiss you right now. He said. Please don't. I have enough trauma with that. Naruto replied while distancing himself from Tony. He can't help but shiver when he remembered his first kiss. Jarvis. Run bring up the specs of the RGM-84 harpoon. We could probably use that as the base. Certainly, sir. Bringing it up now. Jarvis answered. Flashback end. Tony estimated that he could make a prototype by the end of the year and a finished product the next. There's just too much on his plate to finish everything in under a year. As Naruto was musing about Tony's new pert project, he finally reached his destination. He looked at the clock at the end of the hallway before going in. Inside is a 70s-style bedroom complete with an attached bathroom. Balloons, gifts, greeting cards, and flowers are placed around the room. The medical equipment is presumably hidden inside the walls which makes the room unique as it gives the studio a homey feel. Lying down on the bed is an 86-year-old, British woman. Margaret Elizabeth Carter, or Peggy for short, is the woman that started it all. Born in 1921, she first joined the Royal Army before being recruited into MI5 as a cryptographer. 
Being one of their best recruits, she was loaned to the Strategic Scientific Reserve, or SSR, the predecessor of SHIELD, as a liaison and advisor. She was one of the heads of Project Rebirth, a secret program by the U.S. Army to create super soldiers, which eventually resulted in creating Captain America, the only recorded success of the program. An unexpected romance bloomed between Rogers and Carter even before Rebirth, and it continued to grow until the abrupt end when the captain crashed the plane into the Arctic. Fueled by her loss, she started to honor Roger's legacy by creating S.H.I.E.L.D. from the husk of SSR with the help of Howard Stark. She became its the first director and continued protecting the world, just like Roger would have done. But her success in her professional life was balanced out by her inability to get over her love. She tried to move on, even going as far as almost marrying, but the love she has for Steve is just too much ever to let go. Now, she's just waiting for her to be reunited with him, but she just has no idea they will meet again when she's still alive. Peggy heard the door open, revealing a tall blonde man wearing blue jeans, white sneakers, and a black jacket over an orange shirt. He walked over to a chair at the corner of the room and carried it by the bedside positioning. In the old days, she would have immediately been wary of a stranger coming into her room, but her age allowed her to be more relaxed or just more accepting of what might happen next. The two just kept staring at each other when the man finally spoke. Would you mind if I ear here while I wait for Sharon? Be easier for me just to introduce myself to you two at the same time. The man asked while somehow pulling out a large ceramic bowl of ramen from nowhere. Sure, go ahead. Peggy replied with a small smile, although from the inside, she's trying to solve the mystery of the man. They were sitting silently with only the sound of eating from the man when the door opened, opened, revealing a five feet eight inches, blonde woman with dark brown eyes wearing a blue suit ensemble. She's Sharon Carter. The great niece of Peggy Carter herself. Her idolization of her aunt Peggy led her to join Shield at the age of 18. To prevent biases or other forms of inequality in the workplace due to her relationship with the first director of Shield, she doesn't use her last name. She would typically just go by as Sharon or Agent 13. The reason she's visiting her aunt Peggy today is that it's her aunt's birthday today. So imagine her surprise when she saw an unknown man sitting by her aunt's bedside eating ramen. The hospital has stringent security protocols to make sure no one unwanted would get in. So, either the man is well-connected, or he is just that good that he can just waltz in a secure hospital, and right now, she's leaning towards the latter. Sharon immediately drew her gun and pointed it at the man, but it didn't faze him at all. Who are you, and what do you want? Sharon asked in a threatening tone. I'm the guy who's about to finish his ramen, and I'm obviously here for a visit. The man answered with a sarcastic tone. Rude. He added with a whisper. To be fair, you entered the room without knocking. Peggy interjected. We're talking about your niece here, not me. He said before drinking the rest of the ramen. He placed it on the bedside table and looked at Sharon, utterly apathetic to the gun pointing at his face. Pull up a chair. It's too tiring to talk while you're still standing up. Sharon thought about it for a moment before reluctantly pulling a chair facing the man, but still not moving the gun away. Ugh. Really? Can't you remove the gun? Sharon just glared at him. Before I leave today, we're all going to be buddies. The man placed his hand onto the side acted like he was pushing something, but then suddenly a cube precisely a meter wide appeared, surprising both women. I'll even bet this thing. Is, is that? Peggy hesitantly asked. Even though she's quite old, she would never forget anything about Steve, even what material his shield was made of. A large cube of vibranium? Yup. Definitely is. The man confirmed with a grin. Apparently, this thing is worth around four billion dollars. The answer floored Peggy and Sharon. According to Howard, the metal he used on Steve's shield is one of a kind. 
virtually indestructible and versatile. The perfect metal he called it. But now, some guy out of nowhere is strutting around with a massive piece of vibranium, and willing to bet it away like it's nothing. For billion dollars worth of nothing. Who are you? Sharon weakly asked after recovering enough from her shock. Me? Haven't I introduced myself yet? He asked, but he received no reply. Anyway, I'm Naruto Uzumaki, but most people call me Nine Tails. The pair was shocked to learn who they are talking to. In the two years that he's been active, the Nine Tails quickly became the boogeyman of the criminal world. The information he sells is always top class, and the payment is cheap compared to the value of the info. This led to multiple law enforcement agencies and militaries being able to take down criminals or terrorist groups. His mercenary business, on the other hand, is what strikes fear to everyone. It always ends badly for the opposite side. As in no one would recognize you badly. All of this happened without anyone knowing what he looks like, and now, the guy in front of them is claiming he's nine tails. Sharon discreetly started to reach for his phone and call in an emergency alert to S.H.I.E.L.D. when the man, now known as Naruto spoke. I wouldn't try calling Fury if I were you. Sharon's hands immediately recoiled when she heard his voice. You're going to want to listen to what I say, but if the one I'd try hard interrupts this meeting, I'm out. He warned. Sharon was curious en enough to listen to the guy, so she distances her hand from her phone, but the gun is still aimed towards Naruto. To make things easier for all of us, I'm going to let you both ask one question each that I'm going to answer. Peggy immediately grabbed onto the offer and asked. How did you get that much vibranium? The father of my friend gave me some. Naruto answered. Of course, that's not the whole truth. When Naruto asked for a piece of pure vibranium to destroy, it's not for the sake of destroying it. It's for him to be able to study a pure piece of vibranium enough so that he can use the creation of all things to create vibranium since when he decided to produce vibranium before, it always comes up a little different. Now that he has studied pure vibranium enough, he can make as much as he wants. As for burning the sphere into ash, that's just a form of misdirection since if he takes it home whole, it might cause the Wakandans to place him into scrutiny. Sharon decided to use her question to learn more about the supposed Nine Tails. Where are you hiding? Wow. That's a stupid question. Naruto retorted, causing Sharon to flinch involuntarily. I'm not hiding. You don't need to hide if no one knows who you are or the ones that do know don't tell anyone else. Peggy and Sharon understood the last part of Naruto's assertion. Somebody knows who he is but decided not to disclose the information. The only one they could both think that will do that is Fury. They just have no solid idea why. Now we're done with that part, let's continue to why I came here. Naruto said before facing Peggy. I'm here to offer you to extend your life by making you physically younger. His statement caused the Carters to freeze, but Naruto just continued. I can make you as young as when you were 21, as well as counteract the early stages of your Alzheimer's. What? When are you going to tell me about that, Aunt Peggy? Sharon exclaimed since it's the first time she's bearing about it. Peggy gave Naruto a hard glare. Hey. I didn't know she doesn't know. Naruto defended himself. You. Shut up. Sharon shouted towards Naruto before facing her Aunt Peggy again. Why didn't you tell me? Peggy released a deep sigh, preparing herself. Because I didn't want you to worry. She answered. I'll always worry, Aunt Peggy. That's my job. Sharon replied. Ahem. Naruto cleared his throat to get the pair's attention. Sharon gave him a scowl for interrupting. As much as I want you to continue, I still need to hear Peggy's answer. Will you accept it or not? No, I won't. Was Peggy's immediate reply. 
There's nothing to think about. She's more than ready to join Steve wherever he might be. You know. You won't find him in the afterlife. Naruto said with sincerity. What are you talking about? Peggy asked with a dangerous tone. Before I answer that, how much do you trust Sharon? Sharon, of course, took it as an offense. Because I'm dropping two bombs on you, and these pieces of information would change everything for you. I trust her with my life. Peggy answered quickly. How about the fate of the world? Peggy was taken aback by the question, but she answered quickly after recovering. I trust her with that too. She answered. Sharon was touched by her aunt's faith in her, but Naruto's questions made her curious. First of all, Hydra isn't gone. They are in shield. Growing and waiting for the time to strike. Naruto said with no preamble. How? Peggy asked feebly. As far as I can tell, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s recruitment of ex-Hydra agents backfired, but I'm not sure. Naruto answered with a shrug. There are Hydra inside S.H.I.E.L.D., and you think I might be one of them? Sharon asked. Nope. I know you're clean. I just want to know how much your aunt trusts you. Naruto answered. Do, do Fury know about this? Peggy inquired. Oh yeah. Gave it to him more than two months ago. I think he's planning some sort of counteroffensive. Peggy felt tragic that the agency she built to honor Steve's legacy was used by his enemy to grow. She was contemplating about the development when Naruto spoke again. The second thing is, the captain is still alive. Peggy almost had a panic attack when she heard him. Tears started to fall down her eyes. Sharon immediately clasps her aunt's hand to comfort her. How do you know? Sharon asked the question Peggy can't ask right now. This is going to sound weird, but I can contact the dead. Naruto replied. So what? Naruto's answer didn't faze Sharon. She's been working with S.H.I.E.L.D. for almost a decade so she knows there's quite a lot of weird stuff out there. I contacted a lot of famous people's souls to chat with, Cleopatra, Alexander the Great, Einstein. All of them responded, but when I try to call on people who are still alive, all I receive are static. That's what happened with the captain. Naruto explained. Steve. His name was, is Steve. Peggy corrected him through her sobs. Oh my god, he might still be frozen. She realized. That's what I thought of too. Coulson is already looking into it. Naruto added. Peggy finally understood why Phil has been visiting her more frequently recently. It's not just idle curiosity. It's information gathering. So the question is. Would you accept my offer? Why are you doing this? Peggy asked, wary of what might be the catch. Can't I be doing this just out of the kindness from my heart? No. I'm good at reading people, and I can see there's a personal reason for this. Peggy countered. N Naruto let out a sigh before answering. I need a weak test subject for the final tests of my experiment. Naruto admitted. What is this experiment for? Peggy questioned, ignoring the ethical problem of his admission, since they basically did the same to Steve. Mostly regeneration, but it would also make someone something like a super soldier. Naruto's admission took Sharon aback. If he's already in the final stages, then he already knows that it would mostly work. It could change the whole playing field. I'm tweaking the last parts of the process to make sure it would work for anyone so I decided to offer you the chance. I would like to warn you that you still may die. Peggy thought long and hard about the offer, but in the end, there's no other real answer. If Steve is still alive, they can't be together in the short time she has left. Extending her life and increasing her vitality would make sure that when Steve is found, 
they can finally have their happily ever after. After five minutes of silence, Peggy finally asked. What do you need from me? I need you to die. Chapter 36 Too Much to Handle Natasha's Safe House, New York June 23, 2007, 0200 H Local Babe. Natasha forced out, entirely out of breath, while laying on top of Naruto we can't keep doing this. What? Sex? Naruto asked. Yeah. Natasha replied. Why? I can't keep up, babe. Natasha answered truthfully. Where the hell do you get all that stamina anyway? It's been almost four months since Naruto and Natasha got together. Together. The four months they have been together being one of the best memories she had. For the first time, she can finally see herself with someone. Their whole relationship might unorthodox, but it works for them. Fury can't even reprimand her for cavorting with the enemy spiel since Naruto is more of an ally than a foe. She knows he still has a lot of secrets, but she's confident he would slowly open up more to her and her to him. The only thing she can complain about is also a blessing. They have a stupid amount of great sex. The pair would make love at least once a week, and it's rarely just a quickie. Usually, it's a marathon lasting anywhere from three to nine hours, leaving her sore, tired, and satisfied every time. All of these marathon sessions are, without a doubt, Naruto's fault. The guy must have infinite stamina reserves since she never saw him tired, even after their marathon sessions. The Uzumakis have larger chakra reserves than other clans as well as vitality and stamina. Basically, an average Uzumaki shinobi has 5 to 10 times the chakra and endurance of any average shinobi. Add to the fact that I'm a Jinchuriki, well, you get the picture. Naruto explained. So, you're telling me that everyone from your mother's side was a freak in bed? Natasha asked with a teasing grin. Please don't put say that. My mind just imagined stuff about my mother, and I don't want to think about it. It certainly doesn't help that Karama knows about it. Naruto pleaded with a groan. It was two weeks ago when Naruto opened up about Karama to Natasha. He admitted that they were able to mend fences and form a begr begrudging alliance that eventually turned into the dysfunctional friendship they had today. He even told her about his mother being a Jinchuriki and the ability to summon Karama outside his body. But there's something he needs to do first before he can safely summon a being of pure chakra to this world. But seriously, how did your family deal with that? Natasha asked, referring to the whole endurance problem. Well, the Uzumakis usually couple with another Uzumaki, so they don't have a problem with that regard. But in the cases where an Uzumaki is coupled with a non-Uzumaki, there are only two options. Naruto started explaining while recalling about the books he had gotten from the library. Either the outsider is married through a special ritual that would lessen the gap of vitality between the two by siphoning it from the Uzumaki and sending it towards the mate or he stopped, hoping Natasha won't make him continue. Or just say it. Natasha urged. The Uzumaki would have multiple wives or husbands. Naruto blurted out. Like a harem? Not like a harem. Exactly like a harem. Is that normal in your world? Having a polygamous relationship? Naruto asked for clarification which Natasha nodded to. Pretty much. You have to remember that being a shinobi has a life expectancy of 25 to 30 years old, and like 70% of them are males causing the balance to shift between genders. That's why there's a lot of open polygamous relationships in the low to mid-level ranks while the high-ranking ones have open secret relationships. He explained. Add to that the CRA laws. He finished as an afterthought. CRA? Clan Restoration Act. When a clan is down to its last ten surviving members due to any circumstance, 
he or she is required to take on multiple partners to increase their numbers rapidly, rapidly, and with as much genetic diversity as possible. The more valuable a clan is, the higher the partners. It can be anywhere from 3 to 20. You're basically made into a baby machine. Naruto answered with a shake of his head. The CRA laws are just too forced for him. It's one thing to have a polygamous relationship out of love, but having one because it's forced on you is just wrong. He can't even imagine being a woman in that scenario. That's probably one of the reasons Tsunade Bachan left. Wait. Aren't you the last Uzumaki? Doesn't that mean you would have been forced to marry at least three people? Natasha asked. Yeah. Good thing I dodged that bullet. Naruto said with a sigh of relief. With how many high-positioned clans ended, will end, or started with me, the Kage would probably force me to at least 50 partners. He's referring to the absurdly abnormal lineage he has. The obvious ones are the Uzumaki and the Namikaze clans, both of which are highly sought after. The first one for their vitality, Fuinjutsu Acumen, Adamantin Chains, and Absurd Chakra Reserves. The second one is for their innate speed, fighting instincts, and intelligence rivaling the Nara clan. Then there are the Senju and Uchiha clans. The Eternal Rivals. The former is the cousins of the Uzumakis. Famed for their vitality and the possibility of acquiring the Mokutan bloodline, the only bloodline that can reliably subdue a bijou. The Uchiha came from his father's side since the Namikazes was a clan formed before the foundation of Kanoha. They were the rejects of the Uchiha, unable to unlock their Sharingan. The Uchihas are famed for their fighting acumen and the Sharingan, making them more than a challenge for many shinobi. The last ones were the latent bloodlines that activated due to Kagaya's blood integrating with his own. These are the Hyuga, the Kagaya, and the Atsutsuki clans. The Hyugas are famed for their fighting prowess, gentle fist-fighting style, and the Byakugan, or the all-seeing white eye although they are not a member of the CRA. The Kagaya was a feared battle-oriented clan having incredible vitality and the capability to use their bones as weapons. Even though Kurama confirmed that he could use the Kagaya bloodline, he just doesn't use it. All the bone stuff just creeps him out. Finally, the Atsutsuki. Considered as gods of the shinobis because of Kagaya, Hagoromo, and Hamura. Speculated to have immortality and the evolved form of the Byakugan, Tensigan. They have many more attributes, but there are just too many to mention. Add to the fact that he basically has all the bloodlines running through his veins, and it's guaranteed that each hidden village would go to war because of him. Ha. Huh. Natasha let out in contemplation while adopting a thoughtful expression. Naruto immediately felt a chill running through him. It's like the feeling he had before his Shinigan unlocked. He knows he doesn't want it, but after he got it, he loves it. Babe. Naruto hesitantly called. What are you thinking about? Natasha was shaken out of her stupor and looked at Naruto. I just thought of something I never thought I'd be turned on to. Natasha unashamedly announced with fire behind her eyes. Naruto quickly became hot and forgot about his premonition. He, he still can't over Natasha's intense sexuality. Maybe I can help you with that. Naruto purred out while running his hands on Natasha's ass. Maybe you can. Natasha seductively whispered before getting off Naruto and lying down on her side of the bed. Well. Good night, babe. Be careful tomorrow. She said before nodding off. Naruto was left there all hot and bothered, gobsmacked by Natasha's power move. Now he's just sitting on the bed with a boner like an idiot. Fuck. Natasha's Safe House, New York. June 23, 2007, 1300 H Local. Natasha was walking back towards the building where her safe house was at after buying some groceries. 
She dressed in a comfortable white blouse, blue jeans, and black sneakers with a hidden pistol tucked in on her back. When she woke up that morning, Naruto was already gone, but not before leaving her a note and some food on the table. He probably already went to his nine-tail gig. He has a flexible working date making him able to be together with her anytime he likes, but sometimes there are some jobs he just can't resist, which she completely understands. When Natasha got on the elevator, a younger woman quickly got on without registering her surroundings before the doors completely close. She's a 5 feet 9 inches Caucasian with pale skin, green eyes, and wavy black hair while wearing gray jeans, a black shirt covered by a black leather jacket, and black boots. Her name is Jessica Jones. An enhanced. Shield has been monitoring her ever since she was 14 after being revived when their family car crashed on April 13, 2000. According to her file, she's an introvert ever since she was a child, but with her family's accident and the death of her former boyfriend two years ago caused her to develop survivor's guilt and post-traumatic stress disorder. Her trauma caused her to be partially unstable, often dreaming about the day of the accident. She developed a dependence on alcohol to forget, but it barely does anything to her due to her enhancement. When the accident happened, an unknown organization got her hands on her and performed an illegal experiment on her only known as IGH, a possible reproduction of the super soldier serum. IG gave her superhuman strength, speed, endurance, and regeneration. The last part causes her to recover from the effects of alcohol quickly. As for her personal life, she barely has any ever since the death of her former boyfriend. She even distanced herself from the Walkers, her adoptive family, and even Trish Walker, her sister and best friend. The reason Natasha's warehouse was in the same building as Jessica was that when Jessica started to do some hero stuff, Fury wanted someone better to keep a close eye on her from time to time. The talk she and Naruto had this morning caused her to form a plan in her mind. If everything goes as planned, Naruto would be happy, Jessica would be happy, and weirdly enough, she would be happy too. Hey, Jess. Natasha greeted. Oh. Jessica said in surprise. She looks towards the only other person in the elevator. Hey, Sasha. She greeted back. Natasha used the name Sasha Roth when she's using this warehouse. Sasha and Jessica had formed some form of friendship, where they would occasionally hang out. Want to come by the apartment? Natasha asked. Jessica thought about it for a moment. She just came from quitting another job, and could really use a drink right now, but maybe she could do it with her neighbor. There's just one thing she needs to ask first. Is your boyfriend in there? Jessica asked. No. Natasha thought it was a weird question to ask, but answered it anyway. Why? She just had to ask. I just don't want to meet the guy who's keeping the whole building half awake when he's with you. I might just punch him. Jessica bluntly replied. Kudos, by the way. She added. Natasha slightly turned red, hearing Jessica's answer. She already knows Jess is a blunt person, but sometimes she surprises even her. She promptly noted down in her mind that she needs to activate blackout protocol before doing anything else. Are we that loud? Natasha asked hesitantly. Yep and the building somehow shakes from time to time. I don't know if it's just in my head of not. Jessica answered. I can swing by, by the way. Natasha nodded and smiled, but on the inside, she's a little more mortified. She added another note. Tame down Naruto's enthusiasm, or get a bed with shock absorbers, maybe both. The elevator doors opened, and they walked towards Natasha's apartment slash safe house. You can't hurt him with just a punch. Natasha said out of the blue. What? Jessica asked, confused. My boyfriend. Natasha felt like a teenager describing Naruto like that. A punch doesn't hurt him. 
she repeated. Doubt it. I'm a lot stronger than how I look. Jessica retorted with confidence, secretly referring to her super strength, not knowing that Natasha knows about it. If you say so. Natasha replied. Natasha opened up the door and walked towards the kitchen to drop the groceries and grabbing four bottles of wine, a bottle of vodka, and two wine glasses, already anticipating heavy drinking. When she got back to the living room, she saw Jessica lounging on the sofa. She dropped off the items and discreetly activated the blackout protocol as preparation for the conversation she's going to have. Natasha wouldn't normally do something as stupid as she was about to do, but she reasoned that there's a lot of things she usually wouldn't do, but Naruto's presence stirred up a lot of things. She walked back to the couch and poured herself a glass of wine. Jessica's glass is full to the brim with what Natasha assumes as a mixture of wine and vodka. How have you been doing lately? Natasha asked, starting the conversation. Just quit my job, so there's that. Jessica answered with a sigh. The pair talked for at least an hour, quickly going through the alcohol. They talk about a lot of stuff, but nothing personal like they usually do. Natasha determined that now is the perfect time to reveal some things to make her proposal easier to accept. Hey, Jess. Natasha quietly said. Jessica looks at her waiting for her to continue. I haven't been completely honest with you. Jessica immediately went on guard, her inherent distrust of anyone being affirmed. I'm going to tell you some stuff that will alarm you, and I want you to listen through all of it before asking questions. At the end of this talk, I'll ask a proposition that will definitely sound weird. Jessica moved to the far side of the couch, putting some distance between her and Natasha, but showing that she's willing to listen. Natasha took a deep calming breath, thinking about all the protocols and rules she's breaking by going through with this, not to mention the possible consequence that might occur. First of all, my name is not Sasha. That's an alias I use when I stay here. Natasha said. So, what's your name? Jessica asked, not thinking that having an alias is a big lie. My name is Natasha Romanoff. I'm a spy and assassin working for an international U.S.-based intelligence agency. Natasha blurted out quickly, ripping the band-aid off, but Jessica just started laughing. That's a good one. Damn, haven't had a good life for quite a while. Jessica said, but when she noticed the now-named Natasha still looking serious. Holy shit. You're not joking, are you? The organization I work for deals with problems that the world is not ready to face. Highly advanced technology or supernatural stuff is all in our ballpark. Natasha continued with a loaded stare. Jessica realized what Natasha was saying. A whole government organization knows about her and apparently sent an agent to check on her. The reason why Sasha only stays in the apartment at least once a month finally made sense. When you started doing vigilante work, my boss decided it's better if someone more experienced keep an eye on you. So what, this is all a job? Jessica asked, hiding a small stab of pain. No. No. If anything, I shouldn't even be engaging socially with you, but I enjoy your company. Natasha defended. Jessica stayed silent while pacing back and forth in front of the couch thinking about what Natasha said. She feels violated, but she knows she should have expected it. Nothing stays secret for long. You're going to try to recruit me to this spy agency of yours? Jessica asked with snark. No. Natasha answered quickly. It's something weirder. She proceeded. Just spit it out. I want you to join a threesome with my boyfriend. Natasha confessed. What? That doesn't connect with anything you said. Jessica exclaimed. Not really. My boyfriend is an enhanced like you. Enhanced? That's what we call people with superhuman abilities. 
What does it have to do with me? He has similar abilities to you, only more powerful. Natasha said. You can see where I'm going with this. Jessica wanted to shove Natasha's question back to her, but she wants to meet someone like her. The prospect of someone finally keeping up with her in bed is making her a little horny. The fact that Natasha is smoking hot too only helps her case. The only downside she can see was that Natasha lied to her and part of an organization that monitors people like her. She was about to give an answer when the door suddenly opened. Hey, babe. Naruto joyously greeted. He saw Natasha talking with her neighbor. This caused a shiver to run down his spine, which is eerily similar to what happened early in the morning. Naruto. Meet my neighbor, Jessica Jones. Jessica, my boyfriend, Naruto Uzumaki. Natasha introduced them with a smile. If that's what he looks like. We can try a menage a trois as a trial basis. Jessica said to Natasha seriously. Naruto was going to extend his hand for a greeting when he heard Jessica's statement. He finally pieced together Nat's weird behavior and somehow found a willing participant in a short amount of time. He panicked and immediately hirishined away. Jessica was surprised by Naruto's sudden disappearance. He just vanished. Jessica weakly said. You'll get used to it. Natasha replies with a shrug. So, let's talk logistics. She continued. Stark Mansion, Los Angeles, California. June 23, 2007, 2000 H Local. Tony, Pepper, and Morgan are having family time inside the living room. They reserve Saturday night as bonding time with Morgan. No work, no projects, no phones. Jarvis is continuously monitoring the calls and messages for anything that might require an immediate response. The family was playing with the toys Naruto kept on giving Morgan, which now filled a whole walk-in closet, when they heard someone running down the stairs. They would have usually be alarmed, but living with Naruto desensitized them on weird occurrences in their house. Tony. 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 Naruto shouted when he reached the living room. Oh. Hey, Morgan. He greeted quickly. I need help. He continued saying towards Tony. Tony quickly stood up. He never saw Naruto panicking before, so he's on alert. What? Tony asked. What do you do when your girlfriend asked you to a threesome with another girl? Naruto rapidly blurted out. Tony took a second to process what Naruto said before punching him hard to the face. What are you still doing here? Just go and say yes. Tony shouted. Tony's punch and answer were enough to rally Naruto. Naruto nodded and ran out the front door. When Tony looked back behind him, he saw Pepper giving him a disapproving glare. You're sleeping on the couch tonight. Was Pepper's only declaration.